We talked about the convergence of sequences of integrable functions when we first des described these four stages of our opening sequence, the four stages in the construction of the Lebesgue integral. Well, that was in our first television program, and remember there we had a sequence of Riemann integrable functions which converged to a limit function which was not itself Riemann integrable, though in fact it was Lebesgue integrable. Well, in fact, you can guarantee that a sequence of Riemann integrable functions does have a limit which is Riemann integrable. But the conditions are very complicated. Now, what we're going to show is that there are very simple conditions which guarantee that a sequence of Lebesgue integrable functions have a limit function which is itself Lebesgue integrable. In fact, the main result of this program is that the space of Lebesgue integrable functions reflect a property of the rails, a convergence property of the rails, which is called completeness. The completeness property is an axiom in the reals. It states that if we have a sequence of real numbers increasing and bounded, then there's a limit A which is itself a real number. Well, like I said, that's an axiom in the reals. But the analogous property for L1 is not an axiom, it's a theorem. We have to prove that if we have similar properties on a sequence of Lebesgue integrable functions, then we can be sure that they converge to an integrable function. Well, we get uh, convergence to a Lebesgue integrable function almost everywhere. So the conclusion is slightly different. And also the conditions that we have to impose are slightly different than the conditions here. We have an increasing sequence as for the rails, but we don't require the sequence of functions itself to be bounded. The simpler condition which we impose is that the sequence of integrals should be bounded. And from these two conditions, we get our two conclusions, that the sequence converges almost everywhere to F and that F is an L1. In fact, there's a third conclusion about the integral of the limit function f. It's equal to the limit of the sequence of integrals. We call this the monotone convergence theorem. And how do we prove it? Well, in the past, we've always proved our theorems using our four-stage process. That is, first of all, we prove it for characteristic functions, then for step functions, then for l inc, and finally for L1. Well, you'll be happy to know that we don't have to prove it for stages one or, and two in this case. Why? Because it's true for these stages by definition. Well, let's see why that's true. Suppose I have an increasing sequence of step functions now. So the fn are step functions with bounded integrals. Well, I know by definition that that sequence converges to an f almost everywhere, which is a member of L inc. L inc, in fact, because that's the definition of L inc. And by definition, the integral of that function is in fact equal to the limit of the sequence of integrals. So we don't have to prove the theorem for step functions. Well, how do we prove it for L inc? In fact, we have to prove the theorem for L inc before we prove it for L1. What does the theorem say? If I now have an increasing sequence of functions in L inc with bounded integrals, then I must prove the conclusions of the theorem. In fact, we will show that this sequence converges almost everywhere to an element of L inc. So that's the proof for L inc, and afterwards we'll prove it for L1. Well, let's see how we go about proving it in the case of L inc. 
Well, first of all, since each Fn is an element of L inc, then, by definition, it's the limit, almost everywhere, of an increasing sequence of step functions. So we've got an infinite collection of sequences. One increasing sequence of step functions for each function Fn. And we want to prove that the sequence Fn converges almost everywhere to a function f in L inc. Now, for any function in L inc, we know that it's the limit almost everywhere of an increasing sequence of step functions with bounded integral. So what we're going to do is we're going to use all these step functions to construct a special increasing sequence of step functions. We're going to show that this special increasing sequence converges to a function in L inc, and then we're going to show that Fn converges to the same limit function. Well, let's begin by constructing this special sequence of step functions. We take phi 1, 1 as the first step function. For the next step function, we look at these four step functions. And at each point x, we take the maximum of the four values. Let me show you just what that means with just two step functions. If we have two step functions like this, then we can form a new step function which takes the maximum of the two values at each point. We call this the maximum of our two step functions. And we can do this however many step functions we start with. So we can take the maximum of our four step functions to get phi 2. Then we consider these nine step functions and take phi 3 to be their maximum. And so on. So we've got this sequence of step functions. What we want to do is show that they're increasing, that they've got bounded integrals, and then we'll be able to conclude that they must converge almost everywhere to some function f in L inc. Once we've got that, we then want to prove that the fn's also converge almost everywhere to this same function f. Well, let's start by showing that the phi's are increasing. Remember that phi n is just the maximum of all the functions in one of these squares. So as n increases, we're just taking the maximum of more and more functions. So phi n must be increasing. Next, we have to show that the phi n's have bounded integrals. Well, to do that, we're going to prove this. If we can show this, then we know that the integral of the phi n's is less than or equal to the integral of the f n's. And we already know that the integral of the f n's is bounded. After all, that was just one of the conditions of our theorem. So it'll follow that the integral of the phi n's are also bounded. Well, let's do it when n is equal to 3. Here's phi 3. Let's take a point for which all of these three sequences converge. After all, they converge almost everywhere, so that'll be easy to find. Well, at such a point, phi 3 is going to be one of these nine functions. Whichever one it is, if we then move along the sequence, the values will be increasing because these are all increasing sequences. Finally, moving down the f's to get to f3, again, will be increasing because this is an increasing sequence. So when we arrive at f3, we must have a value which is at least as large as the phi 3 we started with. So phi 3 is less than or equal to f3. And by the same sort of arguments, we could prove it for any n. So this establishes that the phi n's are increasing and do have bounded integrals. So we know they must converge almost everywhere to some function f in L inc. Well, the next thing to prove is that the, phi, the f n's also converge to f. To do this, we just have to prove this. If we can prove this, because the phi n's converge to f, and the f n's are between the two, as phi n converges to f, the fn is squeezed between the two values, and so it too must converge to f. Well, let's do it when n is equal to 2. We know that phi 2, 2 is less than or equal to phi 2 because phi 2 is the maximum of these four functions. Also, we know that phi 2, 3 is less than or equal to phi 3 because phi 3 is the maximum of these nine functions. And we can keep doing this, and in the limit, we'll get that f2 is less than or equal to f, and we can do exactly the same argument for any value of n to prove this. So this does prove that the fn's do converge almost everywhere to our function f. Well, there's only one more thing to prove, and that is to prove that the limit of the integrals of the fn's 
is equal to the integral of the f. Well, all we have to do is just integrate these functions in this inequality. And we arrive at this. Now again, we know that the limit of the integrals of the phi n's is equal to the integral of the f, because in fact that's just a definition of the integral of the f. Again, the integrals of the f n's lie between these two values. So by the same squeezing argument, we'll see that the limit of the integral of the f n's is in fact equal to the integral of the f. And that proves a theorem for l inc. Well, <laughs> it seems quite long and complicated, but in fact there's just one or two very simple ideas underlying this whole proof. Essentially, all we've done is we've replaced this sequence f n by the sequence phi n of incre this is just an increasing sequence now of step functions. And it has bounded integrals, so it must converge almost everywhere to some function f in L inc. We've then used these, uh, these squeezing arguments simply to show that the f n's also converge to the same limit function f. And the squeezing argument also gives us that the limit of the integrals of the f n's is equal to the integral of f. Well, that, that's proved the theorem for L inc. Now, what about proving the theorem for L1? Well, this is the monotone convergence theorem at generality. We're given a sequence of functions fn, each of which now is an L1. That is, each of them is, by definition, the difference of two functions in L inc. Now, if we can choose these two functions in L inc to obey the conditions of our uh, monotone convergence theorem in L inc, then it's a fact that we can prove the theorem for L1. Well, here's how we could prove it. We can express each function fn as a difference of functions in L inc. Now, if we can choose these functions gn and hn so that they satisfy the theorem for L inc that we've just proved, then we'll know that gn must converge almost everywhere to a function g in L inc, and hn must converge almost everywhere to a function h in L inc so that fn, which is just the difference of the two, must converge almost everywhere to g minus h. If we call this limit function f, then f must be an L1 because g and h are an L inc. Finally, this result follows because it follows separately for the functions gn and hn. The trouble is, we can't be sure that our functions gn and hn will satisfy this property. We're going to have to be rather cunning in the way we construct them. I don't want to go into all the details of the proof, but just give you a quick idea of how it works. Well, let's start by looking at the functions f1 and f2. We can choose the g's and h's in many ways. Let's take any expression for f1, and let's try to find a bigger g2 and h2 by adding bits to g1 and h1. We do this by adding f2 minus f1 to f1 to get f2. And then we express f2 minus f1 as the difference of two functions in L inc. So we can take G2 and H2 to be G1 plus B2 and H1 plus C2. Now if we want G2 to be bigger than G1 and H2 to be bigger than H1, then we've got to make sure the functions B2 and C2 are positive. Well, can we do that? Let's have a look at C2. There's a lemma in this week's text which tells us that we can always choose C2 to be positive, so that when we add it on to H1, we'll get something bigger for H2. And by the same arguments, we can do this at each step. We can add something positive onto Hn to get Hn plus 1. So the sequence Hn will be increasing. But will it have bounded integrals? Well, that same lemma tells us that we can not only choose C2 to be positive, but we can find it so that its integral is as small as we please. And at each stage, we can add on something positive whose integral is as small as we please. So that although the integrals of the HNs are getting bigger, they're not getting bigger very quickly. And the overall effect will be that the HNs will have bounded integrals. Well, once we've done it for HN, it follows automatically for GN. I won't go into the details. You'll find that in the text. Well. Now we've got the properties we want for the functions gn and hn, so we can conclude that the theorem holds for L1. Well, I, I hope that's given you some idea of how we prove this monotone convergence theorem. It uh, doesn't matter if you've missed some of the details, you'll find them in the text. By the way, it holds both for increasing sequences and also for decreasing sequences. It's quite a useful theorem, but it's of fundamental theoretical importance in the theory of the Lebesgue integral. It's very important, but I want to come back to that later at the end of the program.
In the meanwhile, to get some idea of the mechanics of the theorem, let's see it applied to a specific example. You may remember that in an earlier program, we claimed that this function was integrable, and in fact had integral too, even though it's unbounded. Well, we can now use the monotone convergence theorem to prove this result. We construct a sequence of functions converging to f. The sequence is clearly increasing and converging to f everywhere. So, we have an increasing sequence of functions converging to f. We now have to show that each fn is integrable and that the integrals are bounded. Well, each fn is zero outside a finite interval, it's bounded and it's continuous almost everywhere. And if you remember, these conditions ensure that fn is Lebesgue integrable. In fact, they also ensure that the integral is just the integral from 1 on n to 1. And this works out to twice 1 minus 1 over root n. So the sequence of integrals is bounded with limit 2. Therefore, the monotone convergence theorem tells us that the limit function f is integrable with integral 2. Well, that's one application, and you'll find many more applications in the text. But in fact, the monotone convergence theorem can be used to prove other convergence theorems. This enables us to start with different conditions on our sequence of integrable functions, and yet still conclude that the limit functions are integrable. Well, here's one of the most important theorems that we can deduce from the monotone theorem. It's the dominated convergence theorem. And what does that say? It says, if I have a sequence of Lebesgue integrable functions, which converge almost everywhere to a function, not necessarily a Lebesgue integrable function, and if the sequence is dominated by a Lebesgue integrable function g, dominated means that fn is less than plus g and greater than minus g, then with these conditions I get the conclusion that that limit function is in fact Lebesgue integrable, and its integral is given by the limit of the sequence of integrals. Now, how does this theorem compare with the monotone theorem? Well, in the monotone theorem, we had an increasing sequence, or a decreasing sequence of functions, a monotone sequence. Here, we've relaxed that condition, so it's much more useful. You don't always have a monotone sequence, but we have to pay something extra for it. We have to say that it converges almost everywhere to some function. Remember, the convergence almost everywhere to some function was a conclusion in the monotone theorem. In the monotone theorem, we had the sequence of integrals were bounded. Here we have the somewhat stronger condition that the sequence is dominated term by term. Well, that's the dominated convergence theorem. Now, how do we go about proving it? Well, I've no time to go into the details, but it's based on a very interesting property of convergence sequences of real numbers. Now, inside every convergent sequence of real numbers, there are two monotone sequences just trying to get out. That's an interesting fact. And we use that trick here. In our convergent sequence of functions, we extract two monotone sequences, a monotone increasing one and a monotone decreasing one. We apply our monotone convergence theorem to those sequences, and then we get the result of the dominated convergence theorem. So that's how we prove it. You'll see the details in the text. For the moment, just let's see how it works by applying it to a specific example. I'm going to use the dominated convergence theorem to prove this result. I think you'll agree it does look rather likely. If f is an integrable function, then the integral of f is in fact equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of f from minus n to n. Remember that the integral of f from minus n to n is defined as the integral of the part of f in the interval minus n, n. So we're really dealing with a sequence of functions f, n. And we're trying to prove that the integral of f is the limit of the sequence of integrals. 
Well, the sequence of functions obviously converges to f. But in this case, we can't use the monotone convergence theorem to prove the result because the sequence is neither increasing nor decreasing. From each function to the next in sequence, some values decrease and some increase. On the right, some of the zero values go down. And on the left, some of the zero values go up. But in the dominated convergence theorem, once we know the sequence of functions converges, all we need to establish is that the sequence is dominated by an integrable function g. Well, let's look at the modulus of fn. There's an obvious function g, the modulus of f. And the modulus of f is an integrable function, because f itself is. So the conditions of the dominated convergence theorem are satisfied. And the conclusion of the theorem proves the result. Well, that, that's a practical application of the dominated convergence theorem. Or rather, it's what mathematicians would refer to as a practical example. And earlier on, we saw an application of the monotone theorem. But remember, I said that the real importance of this theorem, of the monotone convergence theorem, was a theoretical one. Now, what do I mean by its theori theoretical importance? Well, that's embodied in the word completeness. Remember, when we constructed our Lebesgue integral, we actually used two techniques. The first technique was that of constructing a vector space from a given set. We did that in going from 1 to 2, and in going from L inc to L1. The second technique we used was adding in the limits of sequences. Completion, if you like. We completed this space to get L inc. Now, you might ask a very good question. What happens if we continue this, these techniques? What happens if we try to complete L1 by adding in the limits of suitable sequences? Well, the monotone convergence theorem tells us, in fact, that we don't get anything new. We get right back to L1. L1 is already complete. Now, that's the important theoretical property. Now, later on in the course, when we talk about norm spaces, these are spaces in which we have a distance function which is defined in terms of the Lebesgue integral, we'll see that these spaces are complete in a way analogous to that of the real numbers. I was almost going to say completely analogous to that of the real numbers. And that's what makes the Lebesgue integral so very important. But we'll see more about this later, because in fact, the rest of the course, the bits about norm spaces, are all about this very important property.